presentation is AIA accredited and attendees will receive one HSU credit for attending. We will post the registration in the chat around midpoint of the presentation and at the end. I would now like to introduce Gabby Atchison from Icon Architecture, a project architect who has been at Icon for eight years. She is our sustainability leader and will be showing us a very interesting project tonight. So Gabby, take it away. Thanks, Kaylee. Hi, everyone. So I'm Gabby Atchison, as Kaylee mentioned, and we're going to be talking about Finch Cambridge today. And I understand that this is usually an uh, in-person tour, so I'm going to try to do my best and walk you through the building um, and show you how this project amplifies environmental and social resilience. Uh, Gabby, I'm just going to cut in one more time before you get started. I just want to let everybody know if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, but uh, Kaylee and I will ask the questions so please keep yourself on mute and then we'll have a more of an open discussion at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Right, thank you. Yeah, and there'll, there'll be a couple of pivot points where we can um, see if there's any outstanding questions before we get to the end. Um, here we go. So um, I think the social and environment so resiliency is really highlighted by the fact that uh, Finch Cambridge is the first affordable passive house at building in Massachusetts. So it's 100% affordable through LIHTC and workforce housing. And that's one, two, and three bedroom units. Um, so it's a mixed income building. Um, it's also enterprise green community certified and fit well certified. Um, so it's really a holistic approach to sustainability. And through Passive House and um, its measures, we've reduced energy consumption by 70% um, as compared to national average. And this view is taking um, a look at the building from the pathway that goes around Fresh Pond, which is right across the street, um, and really influenced the form and design of the building. And so the goal of the building was really set forth by HRI, the owner and developer, and that was to address um, the climate crisis as well as the affordable housing crisis, specifically in Cambridge where this building is and also more broadly. So at the top of the team here, I put HRI since these were their goals um, and they're a uh, nonprofit affordable housing developer based in Cambridge. And they've got lots of buildings in that area, over 1500 units. Um, and they've started to focus on sustainability in the late 90s. Um, and we've worked with them on a couple of projects over the years where they've really tried to push the boundaries of sustainability, which is really aligned with our views as well. Um, and the GC on this project was NEI. Um, this was their first fast house building, um, but they really took it very seriously. Um, and they actually have more fast house buildings that they're working on now. Um, but we are one of many. <laughs> This is a big team. We had lots of consultants. We had um, an envelope consultant, sustainability consultant, um, as well as the people on the passive house, passive house side of the equation, uh, CPHC and a verifier, et cetera. Um, everyone was there to make sure that we were meeting the goals that uh, we and HRI set forth. So on the icon side of the equation, we are a women-owned business. We're Boston-based right downtown. Um, and we have three studios currently, uh, Live, Loot, Learn, and Renew. And underlying all of that is a focus on sustainability. Um, so myself and Michelle Piggin, who's also on this call, we started the sustainability committee at ICON in 2016, um, which was when we signed on to the 2030 commitment. Um, but it's really been something that the firm has been focused on for decades. Her and I um, are Passive House certified consultants. Um, and there's two other CPHCs at ICON. So there's four, which is 10% of our staff. Um, and so we've got lots of experience in that area. This is a picture of um, the distillery, which is in South Boston. And that was completed in 2017. Um, the second building to be com completed was actually Finch Cambridge, which we will be talking about at length today. Um, Harbor Village is going to be completed in the next few months. We've got a couple more that will start construction very shortly, and then we've got a ton more that are in design. Um, so th these are those pivot points that I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to do a, a little bit more of an overview on Finch itself, 
how the site is resilient. Um, and then I'm going to do an overview on what Passive House is, break it down into the four main tenants, and then we can look specifically at how Finch Cambridge um, has each of those tenants within its design. So the timeline for Finch, um, we were funded in 2017. We started in May uh, 2018 construction. COVID definitely threw a wrench in things. We were supposed to be occupied basically right as COVID was, was hitting hard. Um, so that was delaying people moving in until about August of 2020. And so if we look at the ground floor plan, just the site in general, there's a lot of greenery. There's lots of green space. Um, you can see there's a, a green path going all the way around the building. We've got a meandering path. Um, HRI really wanted to make sure that residents had, uh, had access to outdoor space. There's a 25 foot setback off of Concord Ave. We consider that the front porch area, there's seating, there's landscaping. In the back, we have an active play element. There's also a place where you can take your dog outside. So if we move into um, a more typical floor, if you go from the second floor to the fifth floor out of the six total floors, that's really just units stacking on top of each other. So it's the one, two, and three bedroom units. And this building is skewed towards family. So um, half of the units are two beds and 25% are three bedroom units. If you then go to the top floor, the sixth floor, we have more um, community elements uh, common laundry room, a community room with a kitchen, and a lounge area. So in section, it's really um, like a public-private sandwich. You've got an entryway on the ground floor, um, which is obviously public, and then you have more community and meeting elements on the top floor with that private area at the middle. And looking at it in section across the entire site, you can see how close it is to the Fresh Pond Reservation. You've got Concord Ave, which is pretty busy um, in the middle there, lined with trees. It's considered a parkway. Um, and then you can see how that the building sits pretty long in the site um, and how you have that public private sandwich. So if you zoom out a little bit, this is near Alewife. Um, so on the busy Concord Ave, you've got MBTA buses that are running to Harvard. Um, people living in this building also have a shuttle that can bring them right to Alewife. Um, and so being in Cambridge, we follow Cambridge's uh, climate change vulnerability assessment and climate preparedness plan. This building is set within flood zone X um, and per the um, per Cambridge's recommendations, all units are outside of the 2070 flood zone. Um, and all the critical building elements as well. But before you even get into the building, the site itself um, is addressing resiliency in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, we have lots of porous pavement at the rear of the site. We have this huge um, underground detention system for stormwater. And then we also have these two big tanks at the front of the site um, that link to the city's telemetry system because their stormwater and sewer system are connected that prevents any um, flooding um, with high rainwater events. And so if you to apply the flood zone um, and elevation to that same section that I showed earlier, the 2070 flood elevation is just above the ground floor uh, slab. So below that we have sunken uh, parking. It's about a half a level below, and that's sort of a defensible, um, it's podium style. So there's two levels of type 1A construction or steel, and then above that is where wood construction is. On the ground floor, um, even though it's technically above the flood elevation, it's still uh, resilient materials, tile, LBT. Um, and then at the, at the roof of the building, we have PV as well as a generator, and the generator is linked to the community room so that residents can go there in a power outage. They can plug in appliances. The um, kitchen is, will be, would be fully working so that they have somewhere to shelter in place. So this is one of the pivot points where I'm gonna do a general overview of what Passive House is and then jump back into Finch. 
So passive house is really all about lowering consumption. Um, you're, there are specific criteria that has to be met um, in order to get certified. And I just want to point out that everything that I mentioned today has to do with FIAS specifically. Um, that is what we certified through. PHI is another um, way that you can get certified, um, but they have their own set of standards. And Passive House for us is also just a layer of that resiliency. And I'll get more into that. So I get asked a lot um, how this compares to LEED. And it is not a checklist in the same way. And it also doesn't um, meet, have the same type of categories. It's really all about the energy piece and about the indoor air quality. Um, and because of that, it really is a great way to get to net zero. Um, so if you're minimizing your load as much as possible with Passive House, and then you can add renewable energy on top of that, then you can get to net zero or net positive. So if um, at one point, you know, we didn't have technologies available and we were just doing our best to make occupants comfortable inside our buildings, we then kind of went crazy once we had the technology available and forgot about using um, the envelope itself. Um, to be doing that work. And so Passive House is looking at using that envelope as much as you can in a passive way uh, to make the occupants as comfortable as possible. And then that final piece um, would be with uh, just really simple, smaller mechanical systems to get you the rest of the way. So these um, or what I consider the four tenants of Passive House, I think everyone can understand that you've got that thermal barrier on the outside, that continuous insulation. But under that is the air barrier, and that can actually be more important um, than the thermal aspect. That's if the thermal barrier is you putting on a jacket, then the air barrier is zipping up the jacket um, and creating a thermos. So once you have the air barrier and the thermal barrier in place, you then have to make sure you're getting fresh air to your occupants. Um, and once you have done all of those things, you can um, really reduce radically the size of your systems because your envelope is doing so much of the work. Uh, this is a lot of numbers, I understand, um, but these are the metrics for FIAS and just so you have a general idea of how it works. So you've got, um, of course, the heating and cooling demand, um, which is the overall heating and cooling uh, for the year. And then you've got the loads. Uh, peak heating and cooling loads. And that really determines the size of the equipment in your building. So the, the lower that can be, the smaller your systems can be. The air tightness, I wanna point out here that the, the marks that we're trying to meet here is actually five times tighter than code. And that's what makes all the difference. Um, it can really reduce your loads by, uh, substantially. Um, and then of course the last piece here is just your overall energy consumption. Um, and I just wanna, have a little caveat that all of the energy we're talking about here is operational. So none of it is um, related to the embodied carbon of the building, just what is being used to run the building itself. So once you've met all of these different aspects for Passive House, you can see that the total energy pie that you're dealing with, with a cold code building becomes much, much smaller. Um, and the in red is the heating and that's gets radically reduced. One thing that doesn't move much is hot water. Um, that's something that we're looking to find more efficient ways um, to reduce that piece of the pie. Um, but overall, you can see how much lower in general the total energy consumption is. And if we look at this in a different way and with actual numbers, this graph um, is specifically for the distillery, which is was our first past house building. So our energy model um, came in at around 11 EUI. EUI is um, the total energy consumption per year per square foot of a building. Um, so if it was being modeled at 11, um, you can see compared to national average is 78.8. It's a huge reduction. The utility data we've been um, monitoring is slightly higher than that, but still extremely <laughs> extreme reduction. Um, and a lot of the discrepancy between the energy model and the utility data was actually in the gas, which is, is tied to the hot water part of the equation. 
So these numbers um, for Finch, um, basically this is the report card that you would get when um, putting all of your design aspects into the energy modeling platform called Woofy. Um, so the whole point is to make sure that um, what you're designing will meet the metrics. You plan for it before you start construction and you get pre-certified um, with the assumption that your design will meet the metrics. And then once you go into construction, you then verify that it's being built the way you designed it. And that's when you can get certified. Um, so this is our certification letter at the end of construction. And there are so many benefits to Passive House, um, not only reducing energy, but it's just more comfortable for the occupants. The, hair, the air inside is, is cleaner, it's constantly filtered. Um, and if there is a power outage, then you can maintain your temperatures for days at a time. Um, of course, you have to think about things a little bit differently with Passifaz. You're going to be putting more money into your envelope, but then you're going to be saving money in long term with utilities. What I've circled in red on this page is what I think really resonates with our affordable housing clients and really what resonated with HRI. Um, they want to know that their money, they're getting the most out of every dollar that they spend, and I think Passifaz is really doing that for them. Um, so these are those four tenants again, air tightness, thermal control, and the mechanical systems. And sort of the last piece of the pie is then all the leftover miscellaneous loads. Um, so first and foremost is air tightness and thermal control. And that's what creates the thermos of the building. And this is uh, really convenient because we can talk about the outside of the building first on the envelope and how we met the air tightness and the thermal control. And then I'll bring you inside the building. So this is what we planned um, the outside of the building to look like. These were presented to the city. These were our initial renderings. And this is, these are the actual photos of the buildings. And so we really wanted a, a wood warmth, a nice green color to evoke the fresh pond right across the street. And I really, <laughs> want to make it very clear that the air tightness piece is absolutely critical. Um, so in Woofy, if you were to put all of your um, envelope aspects into the model, all, everything um, mechanical related, and the only thing you changed within the Woofy model was the air tightness, how much infiltration was going into your building from the code level to the passive house level, so five times tighter, you would reduce your heating demand and load by as much or more than half. Um, so it's it's absolutely the most important piece. And to just help you visualize what that means. Um, so in white is the, if that were the total surface area of Finch specifically, which is 95,000 square feet, way down at the corner um, is in green, how much infiltration you could have for um, code. And in red is passive house, which is hard to see. So if you blow that up, if you were to meet code, that would mean a, basically one living room window, just a hole in your building all the time. Passive house shrinks that way down um, and that makes all the difference. So of course you wanna make sure that all of your transitions are tight and well-designed. So going from wall to roof, uh, wall to slab, and any penetrations you're putting into the wall, slab, or roof need to be well detailed and designed for. And so we try to make it very clear to the contractor that there are special areas within the building. There, um, there are areas that need to be compartmentalized, compartmentalized from each other. And we have used color coding actually to help us do that. Um, it's been pretty successful. Um, most contractors have their PDFs um, on a digital form out on site anyways, and we had no pushback from the contractor. In fact, we had these drawings um, at Finch and we were asked to add more colors. Um, so once we dove into the, um, the finer grain detailing, we actually uh, assigned a color to every product that we were using. And that was really helpful for us to realize where we had transitions, um, whether or not the products we were using were compatible, and to really um, flush out all the details before they, they were built. 
Um, and so next up, I have a video, which was actually filmed by um, the air barrier company, SEGA. And so I'm hoping this helps you get a sense of the massing of the building. Um, and I'm just gonna talk through the different air barriers that we use. So the, the light blue color is the SEGA um, self-adhered vapor open air barrier. And the white tape is what's at the seams and at any transitions. At the roof, you can see we just taped the sheathing with their, with their same tape and that acted as our air barrier. At the concrete slab, we also use the slab itself as the air barrier. And so we taped anything going through that slab um, to make sure that was airtight. We taped all four sides of the windows. You can see that's the concrete slab. And we also taped the inside face of uh, the windows. They tested beautifully. Um, so we basically just used the weeps um, for any uh, water getting trapped within the windows. Um, and then if we had a slab on grade, um, of course we had a vapor barrier, uh, poly vapor barrier under that. Um, and these are some suggestions of what to watch next, but we are gonna move on. <laughs> So it's really important that the, the field, um, the team members that are actually installing this feel comfortable with the product, they know what they're doing. Um, and we had great success with, with this product um, and they felt really comfortable. It was easy to use. It can, we liked it as well because it can go on multiple substrates. You don't have to um, change when you're going from wood to concrete or CMU. You, um, you can use that same product throughout. But of course there's trial and error. Um, so on the left is some things that went not so great at first. Um, and on the right is the, them um, at the second attempt. Um, and I think NEI did a really good job knowing which subs they could tell more about Passive House to, um, who would really buy into it and understand it. Um, and which subs you kind of just have to say, if you do it wrong, you're gonna do it again. <laughs> um, which was the case here. Um, but once you make them do it again once, they definitely get it. Um, and then moving forward, uh, it's not as much as a, of an issue. Um, I also wanna say that nobody on site was specially trained in any way. Um, of course, it helps to have eyes on at all times, but these are not things that um, a typical tradesperson can't do. Um, but it's definitely, there are a lot of details. This was a complicated building. Um, so part of it is also just knowing when to give the information. What we like to do is obviously they have all the details um, in the drawing set, but we try to do a sort of a three week look ahead um, so that we can stay on top of details that are coming up, uh, refresh them of uh, um, how things are gonna come together, take a look of how it's actually coming together already on site. Um, some things just don't go together the way you think they are. Um, so I also used photos to draw over and explain how sequencing was going to work. Um, and I think that really helped um, make sure we are all on the same page um, and just sort of refresh their memory on how things were going to go. We also had these signs on site, which may or may not have helped. It certainly made us feel better. Um, but I think what's more important is knowing who's in charge of the air barrier. There should be someone who checks on it daily. Um, ideally, that's not the super, unless you have a small job, they have many things to do. Um, it could be the clerk of the works if they're there daily, though it should also be someone on the contractor side. Um, but someone that can take pictures, ask questions, and just have eyes on all the time. And so the windows are really the point, uh, my transition point between air tightness and thermal because they do both. Um, and so the windows that we use are uh, European style tilt turn and that's because they seal so well. So it's all about that air tightness factor. They are also triple glazed, but depending on your energy model that might not actually be necessary. It's all about how it shakes out. Um, but you can see just by looking at this frame, um, how robust it is and what a difference that makes. Um, I have been asked more than once whether or not you can open windows in a plastic house building. The answer is yes. Um, we like to make them operable. 
the idea is that if you if it's nice outside you will open the windows or if you've got a party in non-covid times you might open the window for some fresh air obviously leaving it open all winter would not be a good idea but yes you can open them hi gabby i'm just gonna interrupt here i want to let you know we have some very interested participants in this window topic so um yeah. you've already answered a lot of the questions that have come in okay, um great. Uh, Christine asks to discuss operable windows, which you just hit, um, and talking about, you know, whether uh, that was okay in Passive House. And so thank you just for, for covering this. Um, I also want to just bring up, I'm just looking, there's like five or six questions. So thank you for everyone who just put these in. Um, there's one question from Louisa. Does the fresh air provision exceed code and by how much? And then sort of on that topic, there's another question about whether you done, you would have done anything differently um, designing post COVID because of these fresh air requirements we've been hearing about recently. So I'm assuming the fresh air question has to do with the ERV and not the air tightness it, itself. She's not specific, but uh, Louisa, if you'd like to add in. So each each bedroom, each space needs to be um, serviced with fresh air, um, which depending on how you interpret code is more than code. Um, so yes, you would have to make sure that you're you have balanced ventilation is absolutely critical, um, separate from the heating and cooling. Um, and in terms of the COVID thing, um, we have talked with our mechanical engineers and our understanding is that it, it would be helpful to have this type of setup during COVID because you have constantly filtered air and the supply and the um, return air do not intermingle in any way. So if someone in one unit had COVID, they wouldn't be giving it to someone in a different unit through the air ducts. That's great, thanks. So continuing on the thermal, um, aspect of the building. So if you've got the windows figured out, um, this is just a breakdown of all the R values for the assemblies. Um, the roof is was not continuous insulation. We were up against height restraints. Um, so we have some above and some below. Um, we use the spray foam below also as a vapor barrier. Um, but R55 isn't an outrageous number. Um, for the walls, R27, again, isn't crazy high. Um, it's really just important that you have that continuous insulation. So we have two inches of mineral wool. Then we've got fiberglass in the studs. We would have used cellulose, um, but you can't in type 1A and 3A construction. Um, and a slab on grade, very typical um, R10. The one unique thing here is since we have um, a garage um, at the ground, at the grade, and then units above that, we actually put insulation on top of the concrete slab that's over the garage. Um, we find it's easier to, to make it continuous in that way. And so that's six inches of rigid above that deck. Um, and I guess one added layer here, there's definitely some things we would tweak here um, from an embodied carbon perspective. The mineral wool is, is, is good, but less spray foam is always better. Um, and so from a thermal imaging point of view, you can really see um, in blue here is passive house, which is an almost no heat loss versus a typical building um, in a row house. I think this is in Brooklyn. Um, and so we actually use these on site. These are photos straight from site um, just to make sure that the insulation is being properly installed. Um, but you can also use it to see if there's any leaks. Um, so if this is ideal when you have a temperature differential between the inside and outside. But you can see cold air coming in and you can use that to, to find leaks as well. So here are some photos of them applying that two inches of mineral wool to the outside of the building. So we used um, Cascadia clips as spacers. Um, that's that two inch right there. And we've got uh, infrared images from the outside, you can see, so because it's being taken from the outside, you can see the z -girts. Um If you had taken it from the inside, there would be, um, you wouldn't be able to see because it would be continuous. And that's why it's so important that you have that continuous insulation because otherwise that is how much heat loss you would basically be having through your studs. 
and quality control is is essential and that's we we've definitely designed buildings to um sort of stealth passive house with at finch started out that way um until we decided to get certified but we really like the, the quality control that comes with um getting certified because you you want to make sure that you're building the building the way it was designed and so that it's meeting all of the parameters within the energy model um, so these are a few examples of photos taken on site from new ecology um, just telling the team places they need to improve um, on the different aspects and thermal bridging is also um, you want to avoid as much as possible um, it can be sort of inevitable in some cases but you want to mitigate as much as possible. Um, make sure that any heat loss that's happening is accounted for in your energy model and that there's no chance of condensation um, from a durability perspective. Um, so we have those spacers from for, um, for the Ziegerts at the siding. Um, we also have structural thermal breaks when we have cold steel from the outside going to the inside. Um, and we use them as well when we attached sunshades um, at the outside, again, to mitigate um, that heat loss. Um, and this page is more of a lessons learned because there were some things that we, we missed and uh, noticed as things were being built. One is the continuous garage slab. We had a structural slab um, at the garage level. Um, so that meant the cold slab from the garage was going into the garage vestibule. Um, and so, <laughs> We scrambled, we found a way to put some rigid insulation in, but of course the rebar was continuous. Um, so what I did was I modeled the situation in Therm, which can be a great tool also just to, uh, as a cost benefit analysis to see how much insulation you really need to mitigate um, and prevent condensation. We were able to get a little bit of insulation on top of this lab and overall we're able to um, make sure that condensation wasn't going to happen. The second one was the fact that we have two levels of steel. Um, we hadn't done that previously with a passive house. So um, that six inches of rigid on top of the concrete slab um, wasn't as beneficial as if it had been wood on top of that because the steel is connecting between the two spaces. Um, so the cold from the garage was coming up through the units um, and we could have put a structural thermal break there, but we didn't notice that condition until it was built. What we ended up doing was insulating the, the column um, to make sure that cold wasn't coming through. Um, and we actually used fireproofing. Fireproofing has an R value. We, we found one that had an R3.3 um, and put enough of a thickness there that we knew condensation wasn't possible. Um, and the last piece of the thermal control um, has more to do with occupant comfort. So we we did test shading in the Woofy model um, on east, west, and south at, at different um, uh, depths, and it didn't actually have a huge effect on the, on saving energy. But it we knew that it would have an effect on how comfortable the occupants were. The distillery there are a few units that um, they get direct sunlight, and there's some overheating. So we wanted to make sure that we were preventing that. So now we get to go to the inside of the building. Um, so of course, starting with the lobby area. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the space, but I just wanna point out first that we decided really early on that we wanted to exclude this area from the past house enclosure, which was acceptable to Fetus, um, though they, they don't like doing that. Um, basically, since the lobby is completely different use, no one is living in that area, we knew it was gonna be People were going to be walking in and out of that all the time and there was such a high amount of storefront we decided to bring the air barrier to the inside of the building and create sort of a bubble around that area and this is these are photos from the inside um this is it's a, a story and a half because of that offset of the garage so it's big and open there's this great um open stair which hri was very adamant about and was very challenging to detail, but it was all about um, active design, which had to do with enterprise green communities and people using the stair before they use the elevator. Um, there's a conference room here, just a general lobby area, offices for management, package room, et cetera, all to make the residents feel like they have a homey environment. 
the uh, wallpaper meant to be fun for all the children living in the in the building. But again, a real challenge to detail bringing that air barrier to the inside. So that's that light blue product again. And this is the stair before we had the first layer of jip on. Once we were able to um, wrap the jip around, then we could apply the air barrier on top of that. Um, this obviously would have had to have been separated from a, a fire standpoint, but that added layer of the air barrier was very challenging. And when we did the blower door test, um, it was leaking. You could feel the air coming through. We, we were able to identify where the leaks were coming from and mitigate that. Um, it's certainly the this, this simpler buildings are much easier to execu execute. Um, and if we were to do it again, we would include the lobby in the in the um, past house enclosure and just upgrade the storefront. Um, I think in the end, it, it probably was about the same cost um, with all the material and labor and headaches. Um, another thing I want to note is that because this is a separate space and needed to be fire rated, um, the uh, fire stopping is used at the edges of the assemblies and that also acts as an air barrier. So there's some products that you can use that you're already doing um, that will contribute to the air tightness of the building. Um, and these are just a few of many, many details of how all of this was going to come together. There's m so many transitions. Um, and part of the reason it was so challenging was because because of that sectional difference between garage first or ground and first floor. Um, and I just wanted to add some photos here of that first floor slab situation because it is unique. Basically, we we taped anything coming through that slab. Then insulation goes down and we foam any gaps. Um, and then in this case, we put um, a gypcrete, a uh, really dense gypcrete on top of that because uh, it was type 1A, otherwise you could use plywood. Uh, so if we go up to the sixth floor, which is um, another communal space, um, again, we made the choice to exclude this from the passive house enclosure. Again, I would, not do that if I would were to do it again. Um, so I actually have a video here. This was taken. Let me get it to play. Oh no! Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Well, it was a video um, that was basically just going to walk through um, these arrows here. Um, you could see the long path, the corridor, then you saw the um, the laundry room on the left side and you could walk through um, the communal space. Let me try one more time. So this is um, sort of the finished product. Um, and this was, again, all HRI. It was, they really wanted to make sure there was a great big space for the occupants of the building to go, to hang out. There are little study nooks uh, where someone could do their homework while their parents did laundry, um, a nice lounge space. There's a communal kitchen, um, all about gathering in non-COVID times. Um, and then this all connects to this great um, roof terrace with these amazing views. Um, all the way to downtown and surrounding uh, Cambridge. And on the sixth floor, we also have the laundry room. And I just want to make a note that we did make a bubble out of the laundry room and the trash chute um, because both of those um, have vents that are um, opening directly to the exterior. And that we have continued to do um, because we really feel like um, it ensures that the entire building is not going to be affected the, the performance of the building is not going to be affected by those two spaces. Uh, so basically what we do is we wrap the um, rooms with an air barrier. We have a passive house door as the entry um, and at the floor and the ceiling. It's usually we try to put it um, on an exterior wall and at the top or bottom of the building um, to make it easier to make a bubble. Um, but we've got this dry um, dryer plenum that um, has vents directly to the exterior and we just want to protect the rest of the building from that. And the same goes for the trash chute. Um, so basically what we did is we wrapped the um, shaft liner um, in that same SEGA product 
Um, and once it's in place, you know, we tape the edges and we tape around the, uh, the doors to the trash chutes themselves. Um, and here's some, uh, some more views of the, the corridor, great wood ceiling. We actually had a different color on every floor uh, to help with wayfinding, which was actually even helpful for me. <laughs> um, and in these corridors, um, they're jam packed with all of the systems of the building. Um, so first and foremost, of course, is are the ERBs. They're giving fresh air to the occupants all the time. Um, they have to serve every bedroom, every unit. Um, so, and I also want to point out this is completely separate from the heating and the cooling. Um, so we did central here. There are, there are different approaches to ERVs, um, but here we have two central ERVs that serve two wings of the building. Um, and so we've got chunk lines coming down um, and those are jam packed in the corridors. We um, were up against height constraints here. So our floor to floor was only 10 feet. Um, and so it was a lot, it was a lot in there. This was an RFI, uh, the contractor asking me, does it all fit? Um, and it did, <laughs> barely, but um, part of how we were able to make it work um, was so in blue here are where we have the supply and the return duct, um, trunks really coming and they're able to stay on opposite sides of the corridor um, and then the branch lines can hop over the trunk lines and that was really the only way we could make it work. Um, and then also shown on this plan are each unit has an individual heating and cooling element. So we can pivot for a minute to the units themselves. So the units are each compartmentalized um, and that um, is PASFAO standard. So each unit doesn't have to be as airtight as the entire building is. Um, it's a much looser standard. And because of that, you can actually just use um, gypsum wallboard that's taped. Um, it doesn't have to be a product that's applied, but you know, careful attention um, taken at the transitions and proper air sealing um, at all of those transitions and any pen penetrations, of course. Um, so each unit is compartmentalized. This is um, some views from the inside. Each, each unit had um, an accent wall, um, stainless steel appliances that really make it feel more of a, a market rate than affordable housing. And views of the kitchen and bath here. Um, and so within each unit um, is the interior unit that's tied to a condenser on the roof, um, but it's a central system, um, which meant that we only needed 16 condensers, um, not a one-to-one, -one, so not 98 condensers, which meant that we had lots more room on the roof uh, for other things such as PV. Um, this is all electric, it's very efficient. Um, also means that parts of the building can be heated or cooled at the same time um, and very efficient. <clears throat> and the last piece of the central systems is the hot water. Um, and so we had a gas fired central system here. We've just had trouble finding electric systems at a scale um, for this size of building. Um, and because of that, um, a huge portion of the energy is attributed to the hot water. So it can be up to 30% um, of the overall energy use. But of course, low flow fixtures throughout um, and we're working on getting that as efficient as possible. Um, and this last piece here, um, last but not least, of course, is all the miscellaneous loads. So making sure that you've got Energy Star appliances, you've got LED lighting, smart controls. Um, this is a great view uh, after the PV was installed. So you can see we've got groups of condensers um, and we've got the two, two ERVs, but most of the roof is open. Um, so we have a huge array. Um, and the whole point is to use renewables when you can, but not rely on them heavily. Um, the whole point is to get the operational energy as low as possible and then use that to offset. Um, and I just wanted to bring it full circle here because the whole point of the design is really about the resident, making them feel safe and comfortable. 
um, making them feel like they're at home. This is from one, one resident, uh, Delphine, just talking about how much she loves um, the building, all of the great amenities that it has, um, cooking classes, yoga classes, et cetera. Um, and that's really how it was able to amplify the social resilience piece as doing the environmental at the same time. Um, and that is the end. <laughs> We can take more, uh, more questions. Yeah, that was really great, Gabby. We do have um, several really good questions I'm gonna ask in a moment, but I just wanna let everybody know I'm right now posting the link to get your uh, AIA credits in the chat. So you just need to click on the link in that note and it'll take you to a web page where you, you just have to fill in your AIA number. Um, so with that, I'm gonna ask a few of the questions that have come up. And if you have more, uh, we'll open it up in just a second. So first on affordability, um, Christine asks, were there subsidies to contribute funding to the project? I think yes. in response to the fact that passive house may cost more than a typical affordable housing. Oh yes, um, so there were many funders, um, including the city of Cambridge, uh, Mass Housing, DHCB, um, but there were also, um, we took advantage of the Mass CEC incentives for passive house. Um, so we were given, um, we applied to it late in the game, um, so we weren't given the full amount, but it, there's a certain amount that you can get per unit, um, and I can give you more information on that if you if you need. I can't spit out the specifics of that uh, offhand, but yes, we were we had incentives on that on that end. Great. Um, okay, so this next question is relating to the types of subcontractors you might get on let's say a publicly bid project. Um, Kathleen asks, if the GC doesn't have control over the subcontractor he or she works with, which you might lose over the chapter 149 sub bid, what's the chance of achieving a successful passive house project? Um, all, I wanna say all of the subs that were on this project had never done a passive house building before. Um, and that's the same for the other project we have under construction, um, and I believe also the distillery. Um, so you can do it, <laughs> absolutely. Um, it's just about being proactive, making sure they understand the important details, um, being up ahead of everything that's coming up. Um, but, you know, and more, obviously more and more people are getting trained in it now, but you, so many people are learning it right now, you're not behind if, if that's what you're, where your subs are at. That's really great to hear, I'm sure people. Um, another question is, when you were writing specifications, did you often have to require proprietary projects because of the nature of passive house oh. design? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of specific. So I feel like there are definitely enough window examples oh, um, that you can use um, that are triple glazed and uh, passive house certified. Um, certainly the structural thermal breaks, but even those I can name four or five um, air barrier, there are a lot of different options. Um, let me think if there was something that we couldn't have found an alternate for. Nothing's coming to mind. Uh, Michelle, can you think of anything? Um, fire rated doors that are relatively uh, yes. airtight was a tough one. Yes, that's true. Yep. Um, so there is no, um, passive house certified fire rated door in the United States. They have them in Europe, um, but they haven't been tested uh, here. So the best, the best thing to do is separate the two, have your air barrier at one layer and your um, fire rated barrier at another. So you can have two separate doors. If you can't do that, which we couldn't hear, um, the best door we could find was a uh, Seco Mercury Energy um, door. Um, which isn't glazed at all, which was a bummer. Um, that is definitely one where that was like the only thing we could find. That was the best we could do. Okay, next one. Um, this this question it refers to the fact that you compartmentalized um, and had air barriers between the units. So the question is, um, if there are um, it, is it required to compartmentalize unit, for example, 
if there are suites such as hotels or timeshares that may sometimes connect or not connect in circulation, depending on occupancy be, um, or being rented out differently, um, basically will non-compartmentalized units affect the performance of passive house? Like, so if you have, I think she's saying spaces that may sometimes connect and may not other times. I think I understand the question. Um, yes, you're going to want to compartmentalize um, for, to mitigate against things like stack effect of, of air rising, et cetera. Um, we haven't done anything other than multifamily where you have to do the units to meet the energy star, which is part of the pass fast requirements. Um, but I would think that even if you didn't have to do that, you would want to create um, bubbles within the building so that you're not getting too much air movement without. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, we have two more so far. I, I love how engaged everyone has been on this presentation. I really appreciate all the questions. Um, next one is how has noise transfer been controlled between floors? Um, I mean, we use the um, code standard for mitigation between residential units. Um, so that's not necessarily a passive house thing. Um, but I can say that with the triple glaze windows and compartmentalizing each unit, the, the units are extremely quiet. Um, so it's it helps from a noise and smell um, component as well as um, just like a heating and cooling element. Gotcha. And if anyone who asked the question would like to follow up on them, um, please do. If I'm if I'm missing anything, uh, I this next would like to follow up on the sure. noise transfer. Yeah. Um, between floors on the ceiling, what what do you do? Do you so, have um, clips that are? Um, uh, how how do you do it? It, it doesn't work if you don't if you're not doing some kind of mitigation. Sure, yeah, and I, of course we are. I just, I meant that it, it's actually not any different um, between our passive house buildings and our, and our non-passive house buildings. Um, so what we typically do is we have um, a, a acoustic mat that goes down on top of the plywood sheathing. And then we have gypcrete on top of that. So that's on the floor side. And then on the underside, we have gyp, which is attached to the wood structure with, with resilient clips. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, this is a, a big one and I'm gonna add on to this question a little bit. So the question is the biggest pushback we get against passive house projects is that they will be too expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we respond to that type of criticism? And then I also wonder if you could just talk about, um, you know, who is the motivation in general for doing the passive house? Like, do you need to sell passive house to the client or does the client tell you we want a passive house building? Yeah, so there have been a lot of studies about how much more passive house is to a code building. Um, we, to get the mass CEC incentive, we had to give that incremental cost data to them. So they're creating a whole database based on um, who they've given this money to. So they'll have a lot of more information. I can tell you on Finch specifically, I think it was within the 3% range. Um, and HRI, of course, is going be up at beyond code to begin with. So it really does depend on what your baseline is. If it is a true code, it might be a little bit more than that. Um, but it all depends on where you're spending your money. Um, it had been one of the um, incentives for affordable housing in Pennsylvania long before it, here. Um, and they have studies on it and they've had projects range from cheaper to no cost to I think the highest was maybe 8%. Um, but you can really mitigate that. You, you will put more money into your envelope, um, but there are places that you can save money. Um, and for our affordable clients, um, it really depends. I, I think some clients come to us and want it. Um, we don't have to sell it. Our, the first um, building that we did, the distillery, that was the case. It was, I think, the owner that brought it up. Um, since then, it's really been easy to sell to affordable housing clients because they pay for the utilities and they keep their buildings long term and they're invested in this. So it's not a hard sell, especially with all the incentives in Massachusetts right now. 
Um, market rate, it, it depends on who the developer is. Um, certainly we try to sell it as much as possible, but um, it doesn't have to be a big up upcharge really. That's very interesting, especially the point about for these um, uh, affordable housing that it's actually a much better decision for the occupants. Um, another question, they just keep coming in, this is great. Um, is it more cost efficient and environmentally considerate to air seal new construction or restored buildings? So, you know, if you're doing, um, you maybe you could talk about like trying to do passive house on a renovated building or a historic building, sort of what, you know, what you're meeting there. Yeah, I mean, as long as you're bringing in fresh air, um, then I, I don't see any downside of doing the air sealing. Um, you can definitely reach Passive House doing um, a renovation. Um, we at ICON have not done that yet. I know it can be very challenging depending on what you're working with. Certainly if it's a historical building, that's a whole added layer, um, but it is possible. There are case studies out there um, that have done it successfully. Um, I, we just don't have any experience with that. Got it, thank you. Um, I'm just posting the AIA link again in the chat. I know a few people need to jump off because we are at 7 p.m. Um, but I'm going to continue asking the uh, two more questions we have, Gabby, uh, Gabby, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay. So uh, David asks, can you elaborate from the lessons learned on the sort of roadmap of critical um, uh, first in place details for intersection intersecting trades. You noted color coding specifically regarding subcontractors who are new to passive house and the three week uh, look ahead. Um, and then he, he also adds, would there be a lean construction approach with early pull planning and an actual roadmap documentation? So just maybe walking through that sort of in introducing the contractor to passive house. Yeah, um, so what we have done is basically had a big kickoff meeting where we introduced the, the concepts so that they can understand it whole scale, what we're trying to achieve. Um, and we don't really get necessarily into the weeds. They have all the, the drawings, right? They have all the details, um, but so that they can fundamentally understand what we're trying to do and which trades they're going to have to make sure are, are following those. And then it's really too much to get into every detail at that point, right? So then what we do is we try to be proactive and at our OAC meetings, seeing the three week look ahead, we plan for what we know are critical junctures. Um, if it maybe the, the trash chute is being installed, et cetera. Um, we know that they have to pay particular attention to that. So then we show them the details of those areas. Um, at the project that I'm on right now, um, there was actually sort of like an in-between point too, where we, we did our first meeting and then I did some 3D axons for them of like the really hard pieces of the, of the puzzle so that they could visualize it in 3D and make suggestions in terms of sequencing. Uh, I, to a certain extent, we shouldn't be telling them what order things should be going in, but also if you're going to put drywall over the air barrier, you, that needs to be in first, right? So we have to talk through how it's all going to work with them. And they'll have comments and suggestions or say, well, our, that trade won't be here until this time and, and figure out another way to do it. Um, and then for the three week look, look ahead, it's just sort of keeping on track. Basically we have a standing meeting every two weeks to check in, make sure that everything's going well and to look ahead um, at upcoming details. Are there, um, and yeah, David, feel free to add on to this, um, but are there any like particularly sticky points that contractors, it feels like they don't want to do or they, it's just so outside of their normal that they're uncomfortable doing? Um, I mean, having an air barrier rep to the inside is pretty unusual, but I feel like once you talk through it, I mean, it, all, it, it also depends on who you're working with, but I feel like we haven't really gotten that much pushback. As long as you explain, you know, why you're doing it um, and how the details are intended, um, there hasn't really been much that they were like, no, that like, that's never gonna work. I've never done that before. I'm sure they hear that from their subs, but <laughs> we, we don't hear that. 
Okay. Um, all right. Uh, last follow up. Do you have a uh, sort of a percentage of how would you say you spend any extra CA time on passive house issues? Like, do you have to budget that into your CA fees? Um, we have not budgeted that into our CA fees. Um, I would say it has taken extra time. Um, I'm not sure. Michelle, are we planning on having that as a piece of the yeah, it's a really good question. I, I think the, it does take more time, um, but in some level, it might just be more time on a different facet of CA because that becomes such a strong focus. And as a result, um, I think everybody's energy is there. But we also have, when you're certifying, a, a rater verifier on the team who's whose entire role is to help be eyes at critical junctures and set that schedule of benchmarks and help us so that um, we're, not, we're not relied on to evaluate whether something has, has been executed as designed. That's, you know, we're out there to, to look around and see if things look right, but it's their role really to help ensure those details which is another benefit really, because it's great to have that QAQC role in the field from a third party. Yeah, that's, that's really great. Can I ask um, how many people at, uh, cause I see that we have several people from ICON here. How many people at ICON are uh, Passive House uh, consultants certified? We have four currently. That's, that's pretty good. So a lot of expertise in house uh, during the design phase. Oh, we have one more from Becca. Um, uh, how do you determine the sizes and shapes of project that makes sense for passive house? I, I think some of us have heard about these sort of mega, a few mega passive house projects um, uh, trying to get certified in the next you know, year or two. But mostly I've thought, I used to think that it was only certification for a small residential and clearly that's not true, right? So no, yeah, no. could you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it's great to be able to have a massing model that you can test out in Woofy, certainly. Um, but I think, I think you can really make it work with whatever size and shape building that you have. It just all comes down to the inputs that you have, how much insulation, what your windows are, if you have proper shading for to prevent overheating. You know, this this building is exactly the wrong orientation. <laughs> You know, and we made it work. So I think I think you can get there just um, playing around with what you've got on the envelope. Okay. Well, that's our, our last question for now. Um, anyone, you know, raise your hand or, or speak up, even if you have anything else to add. Uh, thank you, Gabby. This was a really uh, illuminating. Uh, presentation and this will be uh, this recording will be on the um, BSA knowledge committees uh, web page um, I'll find out if I can maybe email all of you a link I'll have to see if I can do that through the BSA so you can have uh, access to that um, but otherwise thank you all for joining this was an awesome kickoff to the year and thank you uh, to everyone uh, from ICON who's on tonight Great, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much.